Good morning, morning. and welcome to the Newburgh Church of Christ. This portion of our service is dedicated to the reading of God's word. This morning's scripture is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. And the word of God reads, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carry about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they live and wait to deceive. But speaking with truth and love may grow up into him all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied according to the effectual workings in the measure of every part, make of increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Amen. 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 That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. We asked if you're able, could you please stand while we go to the Lord in prayer? Let us bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you today, Father. Father God, we thank you for seeing us worthy to see another day. We thank you, Father God, for being the good God that you are. Father God, we thank you for being the God and God all by yourself, Father. Father God, we just Come this morning to worship you in spirit and truth, Father. Father God, we thank you for being so good to us and not because how we've been, Father. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy to see us in a good way today, Father. Father God, we acknowledge that we always haven't been so good to you or to others, Father. And we pray that you forgive us of our errant ways and our sins, Father. Father God, we thank you for loving us so more, so much, Father, that you sent your only begotten Son to come and die for us, Father. Father God, there's no greater gift that someone could offer up his life for someone else, Father. Father God, we just thank you for Jesus. Father Jesus, we just thank you for being Jesus. We couldn't do what you did, Jesus, but we thank you for doing it for us in spite of ourselves, Father. Father God, we ask that you continue to help us grow. Father God, sometimes things get rough down here, as your son Jesus know, Father. Sometimes we lose loved ones, Father. Sometimes we, we just don't know what's going to happen, but we can always call on the name Jesus, Father. So, Father God, we call in on the name Jesus right now that you 
Come and be with us this morning, Father. And Father God, we thank you so much for bringing Brother McCord here to speak with us this week, Father. Father God, may you show himself approved, Father, that he's a good man of God and that he would do his best to say your words, Father. Father God, we thank you for allowing him to come here safely with his family. And uh, Father God, we're just thankful that we have this opportunity to have a gospel meeting, Father. There's a lot of work to be done, Father, a lot of work to be done with ourselves so we can help others, Father. Father God, we thank you for bringing Brother Fleming back to us, and we, you're just a good God that you are, Father, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I certainly want to thank God for watching over me as I traveled from the great state of Mississippi and to uh, the great state of Kentucky, and we especially are elated to be with our brother, to be with our friend, and our fellow comrade in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the person of Brother Kenneth Fleming. And when you've been friends a long time, you know your friends can put you in stuff that everybody else can't. You see how he put me in that UK stuff? He just threw me all up in it, y'all. <laughs> y'all see how he did that? See, your friends, your real friends can do that, and uh, you can take that with confidence. He just said that and never missed a beat. But I am with him on that. Amen, amen. So we're thankful to, to God today for uh, this opportunity for us to come and to uh, share our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to having a wonderful, wonderful time. Now let me just clear up something real quick, and that is my family matters. Now these good folk that's sitting on this third bench right here, uh, y'all please stand real quick. Yeah, yeah, they know who I'm talking about. These good folk right here are from Dayton, Ohio. Thank you very much. Uh, they're from Dayton, Ohio. Amen. Uh, we're, we're family, but we're family in the Lord. All right, my wife is in Mississippi, so don't give me another woman. <laughs> I don't think she liked that too well. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, they're very good friends of ours, uh, both my wife and I. And uh, we preached in Dayton for 13 years, and we only been gone from Dayton for a little over a year. And so there are some folk who still, who loved me when I was there, and we was friends, and they still love me, and we're still friends. And so we're just thankful that they're here this morning to uh, share in this event. But let me uh, get to the real task at hand this morning, and we hope and trust that you have your Bibles and uh, we hope and trust that you will follow along with us. Uh, the theme of this series of lessons for this gospel meeting is perfecting our gifts. And so every lesson in one way or another is going to uh, focus in on our, the idea of our gifts. But we're also hoping to put a little bit of an evangelistic thrust to it because if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're not a member of the churches of Christ and you do not share in our religious beliefs or conviction. We, don't want, we do want to encourage you to get your Bibles and to study along with us that you may know whether or not these things are so. In Acts chapter 17 and verse number 11, the Bible said, And these were more noble than they of Thessalonica. And that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. And so I even encourage church folk to get your Bibles and to make sure that what we're going to be sharing with you is found in the Word of God. I want to do that by inviting your attention to the book of Ephesians. The chapter is 4. And we're going to read verses 7 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 7 through 16. The Bible said, but unto every one of us. Now I want you to notice the phraseology and what Paul is saying. But unto every one of us is given grace according 
to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might feel all things. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers for the perfecting of the saint, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now go back and look with me at verse number 8. And notice what he says in verse number 8. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. I want to speak from the subject this morning, he gave gifts unto men. He gave gifts unto men. In this letter, the Apostle Paul spent time on the believer's position in Christ. He spoke of the grand and eternal purpose of God in the church. But in this particular chapter and beyond, he shifts from what God has done in eternity's past to what God, to what we are to do in response to what God has done for us. In the first half of this book, he wrote about the ingredients of belief. That is, he wrote about doctrinal matters focused on God, but the second half of this epistle contains instructions for our behavior or our duty in the body of Christ. This is important because God is glorified through our belief system and the behavior of his children filled with the spirit motivated by the love of Christ and empowered by God. Right. Notice what the Bible said in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 7. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 7, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, I want to lay this out early in the process of talking about what Christ has done for you and what Christ has done for you and what Christ have done for you. And that when Jesus Christ came into the world and accomplished what God had had in mind for him, the Bible lets us know that according to his measure of grace, he has given unto every one of us a gift. And we're going to talk about this more and more as the week goes on because one of the issues that many people are having in the church, number one, is identifying what gift they have or trying to figure out how to use that gift in the body of Christ. So I want you to understand that the text plainly says that he gave gifts 
unto men. There are some specific gifts in our text. Some of those gifts were temporary in nature and some of those gifts was permanent in nature. So I want to help you to understand this morning that whatever gift God has given you, he intended for you to use it in functioning in the body of Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans chapter 12 and beginning at verse number 3. In the book of Romans chapter 12 and beginning at verse number 3. Listen to what the apostle Paul said to the church at Rome. The Bible said, for I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now I want you to watch him in the next verse. He said, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same often. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one member one of another. Watch verse 6. Having then give differing according to the grace that is given to us. Where the prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministering let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation and he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness now again this particular verse conveys the idea that according to God's grace according to what God has measured out that all of us have been given a gift. Now there's only one body but there are many members in that one body and that no one member have the same function in that body. We all have our own unique gift set. Brother Flemings has a gift set that is unique to Brother Flemings. I've been given a gift set that is unique to me. You've been given a gift or perhaps you've been gifted with more than one that has been given to you to be used in the body of Christ even though we don't have the same function just like my ears don't have the same function that my eyes have and my eyes don't have the same function that my hands have and my hands don't have the same function as my foot have, but all of them have a function in the body, but we need to understand that when Jesus came, he gave gifts unto men. See, God has always supplied the body, that is the church, with everything it needed to fulfill her purpose in the world. But when the Apostle Paul wrote the church at Ephesus, most of the New Testament had not been written in its completion. Therefore, they had some special needs and God supplied for those needs in a special way. To supply the infant church with their need, Christ gave gifts to various men within the church. Now I mentioned a moment ago that some of those gifts were temporal in nature and some of those gifts was permanent in nature. Our focus in this meeting is to try to identify the permanent our gifts in the church and to help you to discover whether or not you have that gift or not and if you do have that gift how are you using it to build up the body of Christ see whatever your gift may or may not be once you identify it it should be used for no other reason than to build up the body of Christ so the first thing that I want to raise is when 
were these gifts given. We know he gave gifts unto men, but when were these gifts given? Go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and beginning at verse number 8. Listen to what the Bible said in the book of Ephesians chapter number 4 and beginning at verse number 8. The Bible says, where for? When he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, now he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven that he might feel all in all. Now I want you to keep that in mind, but I need for you to travel back to the book of Psalms 68 and verse number 18. And I want you to watch this real carefully. Psalm 68 and verse number 18. The Bible said thou. This is a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. Now remember our text says that Jesus led captivity captive when he ascended far above into the heaven. First of all, he descended, that is, he came down from heaven into this world. But then he did something else that we'll talk about in just a moment. But listen to the psalmist in Psalm 68 and verse number 18. The Bible said, thou has ascended on high. Thou has led captivity captive. Thou has received gifts, watch this, for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Now, I want you to notice something real carefully here. And that is, you notice that the psalmist said that when he led captivity captive, this is what he did. He received gifts for Men. Now here is what normally happened. Normally when a person was in a position of kingship, people bought gifts to king. You remember even when Jesus was born that what we call the three wise men, they bought gifts to Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of law. There are all kinds of examples in the Old Testament where men bought gifts to king. But in this particular case, Brother Fleming, the king of king, he bought gifts and gave them to men. Because I want you to see that when Jesus went down into the grave and accomplished God's purpose, he rose up and instead of men giving gifts to him, he gave gifts unto men. Listen to what the Bible said. He gave gifts unto men. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Listen to what John the Revelator writer is going to tell her. See, this was... Fulfilled, the psalmist passage was fulfilled when Jesus went down into the lower parts of the earth and stormed the gates of the enemy, gaining victory over death, hell, and the grave. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 17, the Bible said, And when I saw him, that is when John saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. And he's laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of the hell and of death. Now notice this real carefully. When he went up on high, when he captured his spoil, there's things that is called the spoils of war. He gave gifts 
to men, the same one who went down into the depths of the earth, this same person has now ascended high above the heaven. And when he did this, the Bible says that he gave gifts unto men. After Jesus Christ went down into the lower parts of the earth and took out of the hands of the graveyard its power, its ability to hurt or to harm us. He gave gifts unto men. He didn't just descend from heaven and come down here on earth. He went down into the lower parts of the earth and down there is where he won his victory. See, if you look at him from Calvary's standpoint, he looked like he was defeated. But when you look at him from the resurrection viewpoint, he was victorious. Listen to what Paul or what Peter uh, said as recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse number 26. Listen to what the Bible said in Acts chapter 2 and beginning at verse number 26. The Bible said, therefore, did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption thou has made known to me the ways of life thou shalt make me full of joy wilt thy countenance men and brethren let me freely speak Unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and in his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, that's speaking about David, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that is of the fruit of his lawn, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen this beforehand spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up from the dead, wherefore we all witness him, therefore being by the right hand of God, exalted and have received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he shed forth this which you now see. For David is not ascended into the heaven, but he said unto himself, oh, my Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. So he wanted to make sure that they didn't misunderstand. I'm not talking to you about David. David is dead and in his sepulchre with us this day. But it was Jesus of Nazareth who went down in the lower parts of the earth, raised up by God, and now he sits on the right hand of God. And when he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. He gave gifts unto men. When he captured, when he led captivity captive. See, the very thing and I find this very interesting. The very thing that was supposed to have captured Jesus, Jesus captured it. That's what it meant when he said he led captivity captured. He captured captivity. See, when a war was fought and the victory was won, most of the time when the victor Return in great triumph with gifts for men. It was then that Jesus had completed his mission on earth. He came down from heaven. He was God manifested in the flesh. He emptied himself. He became a servant in the form of man. He lived a life of labor, poverty and temptation. He tasted death, the most shameful death possible. The arrest, the trial, the scourging, 
and the crucifixion and then into the grave that was as low as he could go. But listen at Paul in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9. The Bible says in Philippians chapter number 2 and beginning at verse number 9 after Jesus had went down into the heart of the ground, the Bible says in Philippians 2 and verse 9, Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ at every knee should bow, and of things in heaven and things of the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, even though Jesus suffered, bled, and died on Calvary, God has highly exalted him far above the heavens. Far above the heavens. He gave gifts unto men. See, his exaltation corresponded to his humiliation. It was as high as he could go, far above all the heavens. And then he gave gifts unto men. But then secondly, what were the gifts? What were the gifts? Go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 11. The Bible is very plain. We've been using and quoting this Scripture for years in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. The Bible said, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. This passage deals with the gifts, not the offices. God gave some to be apostles prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. His gifts were that they should be the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, qualified the men by providing whatever was necessary for them to fulfill their offices. The gifts were listed in order of importance, apostles simply means one sent for. Primarily it referred to the twelve, but in a secondary sense to others. In the book of Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 19, listen at what the Bible said in Galatians 1 and verse number 19. The Bible said, but other of the apostle saw I none, same James, the Lord's brother. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 1, look at how the Hebrew writer uses the word apostle. He said, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now in this verse, Jesus is described as an apostle. Just like you had uh, shepherds in the New Testament, but Jesus is called the chief shepherd. Here he is, the chief apostle. He stood out from the rest of the apostles because he was sent by the Father, and he was the one that selected the twelve and sent them out. And they were a gift to the body of Christ. See, they were a gift. See, sometimes we don't see what we ought to see as it relates to what the Lord gave to the church. Look in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 20 and 21. Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 20 and verse number 21. The Bible says, and are built up, built up 
on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto us and holy temple in the Lord. Now it all started with Jesus Christ. He is the chief apostle. He select 12 men. Paul born out of due season. These men became stones in the building. He set them first in the building because they were the one that was gifted to the church so that the church could mature and develop as God intended. See, God knew exactly what he was doing. See, God knew exactly what he was doing. See, when you use the word apostle here, it is used here in its strictest sense. The 12 and Paul born out of due season, all they received all the help they needed to fulfill their office. But then there, were, there was the gift of prophets. There was the gift of prophets. There were the gift and the responsibility of prophets they were to foretell. Look in Acts chapter 21 and verses 10 and 11. I'm just going to give you a sample of these and we're going to move on. But at least I want you to see that what I'm telling you in Ephesians 4.11 is in other places in the scripture. Look in the book of Acts chapter number 21 and the verses there are 10 and 11. The Bible said in Acts 21 and verse number 10. The Bible said, and as we tarried, there are many days that came down from Judea a certain prophet. Y'all see that? There's a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, thus said the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentile. Now notice what Agamus does. He foretells Paul something that the Holy Spirit told him that was going to happen to Paul. Now Paul was an apostle, but the Holy Spirit did not reveal it to Paul himself. He used a prophet to foretell Paul what was going to happen to him. And when Jesus led captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men, first apostles and secondly prophets. They were gifts to the church. Now the reason I keep on stressing this is because you and I need to understand that when God gives you a gift, well, let me put it this way. When you receive a gift, what is your response to the gift? See, most of us enjoy and appreciate a gift. When somebody give us something, not because they owe it to us, not because we're necessarily deserving of it, they just want to give you a gift. Especially when somebody slips something in your hand and it's paper and it's green. It's not, listen, we like them kind of gifts. What I'm trying to convey to you is, is that whatever the permanent gifts are in the church today, we need to see them as gifts from God. The reason why that's important, we spend a lot of time criticizing the very thing God's given us. Rather than learning to enjoy what God has given us. See, the prophets, they could foresee the future. Convict men of sin, exhort and speak truth, which had been revealed to them. But also, there was the evangelist. There was the evangelist. Look in Acts chapter 21 and verse number 8. Acts chapter 21 and verse number 8. The Bible said in the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip, who? The evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. 
Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 5. He said, watch thou in all things. He said, do, uh, uh, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So now evangelists were one of the gifts. You had the apostles, you had the prophets, and you had the evangelists. But you also had pastors. They were to shepherd the flock. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. The Bible said, take heed unto yourself and to the flock. Oh, which the Holy Ghost have made you overseer to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. They also had teachers. Look in Acts chapter 13 and verse number 1. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 1. The Bible said now there were in the church that was at any art, was there certain prophets and teachers. See, the need of each gift and the work of each office determines its permanency. If the need for the gift was temporary, the office was temporary. If the need for the gift was permanent, the office was permanent. This text deals with the gifts, not the permanency of their use. Because you do see that there are some gifts that are permanent in nature. But then why were the gifts given? Why were the gifts given? We know he gave gifts unto men. We know what those gifts were. But why did he give those gifts? Look in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. He's going to tell us why. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 12, the Bible said, For the perfecting of the same, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body. There are three fours there. And each four is there for a reason. The gifts were given, and I noticed the theme said perfecting our gift. The gift was given for the perfecting of the saints. Not sinless perfection of the individual, but a perfect system of religion and Christianity Reveal the truth was revealed only partially then, but all the truth was needed for completeness in Christ. Therefore, the reason for the gifts. Why were the gifts given? For the work of the ministry, which was designed to perfect the saints. The gifts equipped the saints to serve. Not just a paid staff, but every Christian is to serve in the body. Listen, every member of your body serves a purpose, doesn't it? Every member of your body serves and fulfills a purpose, doesn't it? And if you have a member on your body that's not cooperating with the rest of your body, and you get concerned about it, you go to the doctor and get it checked out, don't you? I don't care if it's your pinky finger or your pinky toe. You go to getting concerned about that thing because here's what's happening. It seems, listen, you can have a, 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 a so toe as something as simple as that and you get so concerned about it, it'll affect the way you walk because God put it there for a reason. He didn't just set you in the body for you to sit on a pew. He gave you something in your body so you can function in the body. He, he didn't just give us gifts to be having gifts. But he gave those gifts for a reason. See, we must become participants instead of spectators in the body of Christ. Why were the gifts given? For the edifying of the body, which also a means of perfecting the saint. Listen, every gift in the church ought to be used for the building up 
of the body of Jesus Christ. Y'all go to Romans chapter 14 and verse 19. And listen to what Paul told them. And then we'll hit our final point and the lesson will be yours. Romans chapter 14 and verse number 19. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans 14 and verse number 19. The Bible said, let us therefore follow after the thing which makes for peace. And things wherewith one may edify another. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. I'm going to look at verse 3, verse number 26. Listen to what the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse, number, and verse number 3. The Bible said, but he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Y'all remember that. Go to verse number 26 where the Bible says in verse number 26 of that same chapter how is it then brethren when you come together every one of you has a psalm and has a doctrine has a tongue has a revelation has an interpretation that all things be done unto edifying look in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 16 in the book of Ephesians I'm running through it because you don't know how far I gotta go Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 16 listen to what the Bible says from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part make an increase of the body wants this unto the edifying of itself in love. I don't know how many times, Brother Flemings, I've heard church folk talk about being bored in the church, talk about, well, he don't do nothing for me and I just don't get nothing out of that. It may be because you're not putting nothing in it to help edify the body. I went through all of those edification passages to help us to see that whatever gift you have, whatever talent you've been given, whatever ability God's given you, it is to build up new birth. Anybody can tear stuff down. It ought to build it up. It ought to build it up. You notice Ephesians 4, 16 said building itself up. You should listen. If you've ever been, and some people are, person into exercising, you can build your body up without having one weight if you know what you're doing. You, listen, you don't need no special, no special tools or nothing. If you know how to do certain exercises properly, you can build your own body up. Because the average person is heavy enough to make themselves stronger if they were use their own body. See, we can make ourselves stronger within the local body if we use what God's given us to build up ourselves. That's what he said. Why were the gifts given? They were given for the perfecting, for the equipping of the saint. It was given for the ministry that is in service to God. And it was given for the edifying of the body of Christ. See, the church can grow by the members becoming stronger. See, the word can do this for us, but then they need the gifts to enable them to grow. And as much as they had both the temporary and the permanent gift. So here's the benefits of those gifts. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. This is the final point, and that is what benefits with these gifts. Ephesians 4 and verse 14 and 15 that we henceforth be no more children. Let me say this and just move on. We have too many children in the church today. Toss to and fro 
and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. See, no more in maturity. No more instability. No more gullibility. But maturity. Y'all know Hebrews 6 1 said, let us go on to maturity. See, we need to mature. See, the Christians, like the Christians, like many today, have been carried away with every wind of doctrine or teaching, not knowing the difference between truth and error. But these gifted men inspired men. Their word was confirmed by God. The immediate results of the spiritual gifts and able the infant church to function. The permanent intent of the spiritual gift were to perfect the body, edify the body, to build up the body. And when the body is built up, guess what? The body can glorify God. Listen. Jesus gave gifts to men. Now, you know, and we'll see this in one of our other lessons this week. We no longer have apostle. That was a temporary gift. We no longer have prophets. That was a temporary gift. And when I say prophets, I mean in a technical sense. There is a sense in which we do. But in the sense I'm using it in a miraculous way, we do not have prophets. But we do have evangelists. We do have pastors. We do have teachers. That's where the gift set starts. But also you're going to see that there are gifts in the membership. And whatever gift God has given you, that gift should be used to build up the body of Christ. Remember Romans 12 said that we have not all the same office. In other words, you may not be able to do what sister so-and-so can do. You may not ever be able to do what brother so-and-so can do. If you can learn, and this is what I've learned uh, in my ministry, and one of the things that I've always enjoyed, now I'm not a, I'm not a singing preacher. I'm not a singing preacher. But my wife has been kind to me. She tells me I can sing a little bit, but... That's her. I, I'm not a singing preacher. And I'm not a song leader per se. But I don't have to be to enjoy somebody who can. Amen. See, I don't have to have that gift set. See, even when I get ready to go to heaven, when I go to heaven, listen, I don't, listen, I don't have to sing in the heavenly choir. Just let me sit around the throne and listen. I don't care. See, we can ever learn this in the church. You don't have to do what somebody else can do. Learn to enjoy that gift. Do what you can do. Don't be saying, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. Maybe God didn't give you the gift. Amen. Exactly. Learn to appreciate the gift God has given somebody else and benefit from it. And let them benefit from your gift. And if we could ever learn to do that in a free atmosphere, we can build each other up. We can build each other up. Because we just need to learn to benefit from the gifts of others. Because there's no doubt he's given gifts to men. Now, he didn't give that gift to everybody. See, everybody can't be an evangelist. Everybody can't be a pastor. You know, how do you know that to be true? This is how I know that to be true. You remember I said that in Ephesians chapter 4, he's speaking of the office. But in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he's speaking of the qualification that you got to have to be in the office. 
you got to meet certain qualifications. That's why everybody can't do it. Everybody can't preach. I take issue with the fact that anybody can just jump up and preach. That's not true. If that was true, we would, try, we would be trying to look for a good preacher all over our brotherhood. We just grab us a good one and just say, well, look, church full of good preachers. You all know that's not true. All I'm saying is, is that whatever your gift set is, try to identify that and develop that in service to God and to the glory of God and to the upbuilding of his church. Now, you may be here this morning and you're not a Christian, you're not a child of God. Jesus has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. And that he died, he was buried and rose again. Went to Calvary's cross and suffered on your behalf and mine. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, uh, but God has commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for you. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sin according to the scripture. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The question is, do you believe that? Jesus said in John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that except you believe that I'm he, you should die in your sin. Amen. And be willing to repent of your sin. Well, what is repentance, preacher? It means that you've got to change your directions by changing your mind. That's what repentance is. Acts 17, 30, the Bible said at the time of this ignorant God winked at, but now command all men everywhere to repent. You got to be willing to change. After hearing the word, believing it, you repent of your sin, you be willing to come down these aisles by faith and confess the sweetest tongue that ever been announced upon mortal tongue, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You remember in Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, the Bible said he began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the unit said, See, here's water. What doeth hinder me be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believe with all thy heart, thou mayest. And the unit said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And based upon that confession, they stopped that chariot. And Philip and the eunuch got out of that chariot. And they both went down into the water. That's important. Because see, if he was going to sprinkle him, it didn't take both of them to get in the water. If he's going to pour a little bit on him, it don't, take, it don't take both of them to get in the water to get so little water poured on you. No, 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 they finna go down in the water. They both went down into the water and Philip baptized him and they both came up out of the water. So baptism is a going down into and a coming up out of. It is a submersion underneath the water. Paul called it in Romans 6 and verse 4 a burial. Well, now why do you need to be baptized, preacher? You need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. You need to be baptized to get your sins washed away, Acts 22, 16. You need to be baptized to contact the blood of Jesus Christ if you want to be saved. And when you are saved, you become a member of the Lord's church. He'll add you to it, Acts 2, 41 and 47. And then when you're raised to walk in the newness of life, you use your gifts in service to God. You use your gift to the glorification of God, and you use your gift for the building up of the body of Christ. Amen. If you're here this morning, you're a member of the church, and for some reason you need to respond, we want to extend that invitation to you as well as to those who are not members. As together we stand and say, the Lord bids you to come.